Dear members and guests, welcome to our webinar with Abu Dhabi Art. For those who don't know me, I am Barbara Faranik Matonet, founder and president of the Art Circle. This year is the 12th edition of Abu Dhabi Art. It started the 19th of November and will continue till the 26th. Because of COVID, it's an interactive digital edition that brings together galleries and artists from across the world in a number of curated gallery exhibitions and sectors. The amazing team of Abu Dhabi Art is very close to my heart. As some of you may know, they supported the Art Circle from the very beginning, and we want to greatly thank again all the Abu Dhabi Art team for that. Today, we have the privilege to have with us Nada Raza, who is curator for the second year of the gallery sector, A Picture Helds Us Captive. Nada Raza is curatorial advisor for Al Circle Art Foundation, Prior to this, she was the founding artistic director of the Ishara Art Foundation in Dubai, research curator at Tate Research Center Asia. She also worked on international art at the Institute of International Visual Art and at Green Cardamom in London. Nada curated many major exhibitions around the world. She holds an MA from the Chelsea College of Art and Design and is a doctoral candidate to the Cultural Institute of Art. Today, Nada have brought to us amazing artists, Augustine Perez, Sarah Naim, Michael John Willan, and Sarah Almaheri. But I will leave to Nada the privilege to introduce them to you in details. Before starting, I would like to ask you to address your question by writing them in the chat function that you can find on your screen. At the end of the presentation, Nada will ask them for you. Nada, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Barbara. And um, it is indeed a great privilege. And for that, I would like to thank the Art Abu Dhabi team and also thank you um, and all of the people from the Art Circle who are listening to us this morning. Um, today is really about the artists. I'm really pleased that four out of the eight artists in uh, the exhibition will be talking to you about their work today. Um, but before I introduce them, just a few words about the exhibition, which I hope you will see on the online edition of Art Abu Dhabi. Um, the presentation is called A Picture Held Us Captive. And we have um, one artist or practice that is featured for every day of the online fair. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, and the premise is, is really um, thinking critically about the idea of the online presentation of art in itself. Um, you know, over this past year, the art world has very quickly pivoted um, to, to remaining connected to its audiences as much as possible in the circumstances. And we have been working very hard to bring exhibitions online. And I thought this was an opportunity to take a step back and really think about what that means. Um, the invitation from Abu Dhabi Art was to uh, do an exhibition that featured work by artists that are represented by galleries based in the UAE. So the eight artists that I selected are represented by galleries mostly at al Sakal Avenue which is a sort of destination for contemporary art um, in, in the city and in the region. And this was an opportunity for me to look back at the last, uh, let's say, two decades of practice, but this either have strong ships with or artists whose practice I admire. Um, and A Picture Held as Captive is a selection of work that in, in some ways challenges um, what, what I feel um, is happening at the moment where we're taking kind of two dimensional works and, and creating virtual environments and, and trying to sort of recreate reality. And I wanted to puncture that a little bit and, and think about what it means instead um, to, to um, create this world where we're very dependent on visual language, where we're very dependent on the image um, and, and to think more about a slightly more nuanced conversation. Um, because really a lot of uh, work that has happened, especially with sound and with video art in the last 20 years is, um, you know, these are media that do translate well digitally, photography, for instance. Um, and, and so often the art world is, is focused on sort of the preciousness of the object. And I wanted to go back and really think about form and content again. 
So I hope that you will take a look at the show online um, and the artist actually featured today, uh, Michael John Wellen is with us and, and we'll talk about his work. Uh, just to introduce the four artists that you'll be hearing from today, we have Augustine Paradez. Uh, Augustine is a photographer. Um, he's originally from the Philippines, but lives and works in Dubai. Um, and he'll be talking about his work, but also um, the project that he did with Al Sarkal Online um, that we have featured a glimpse of for Al Abu Dhabi. Um, and uh, the next artist you'll hear from is Sarah Naeem. Sarah is also based between Dubai um, and, and grew up partly in London. Um, she's based here at the moment. Um, her work uh, is, is um, looking again uh, digitally, um, you know, and, and she um, looks at both the micro and the macro sort of level of, um, um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, the universe um, really zooming in into the microscopic. Um, and the work featured in the show is a video that she'll tell you a bit more about, but also talk about her, her sculptural practice. Um, and then we will hear from Michael John Wellen, who joins us from Berlin, um, originally from Ireland, um, MJ, as, as we call him. Uh, is somebody who has spent a lot of time in the UAE. Um, he's done a residency here with Al Sarkal, um, and uh, he will be talking about a work from 2007 that's in the show, The Collector of Skies, um, but also talking about his photographic practice, and MJ is someone who deals, who, exp who, who thinks about both time and exploration in, in really beautiful ways. And the final artist we'll hear from today is Sara al Muheri. Um, Sarah is based in Abu Dhabi, uh, recently graduated from NYU. Um, her work is extremely sophisticated um, and deals with text um, and with texture. Um, and the work that we have um, featured for the presentation for the fair is In Conversation, which is uh, a piece which is a letter to an artist that she admires, um, and then also an artist talk series, which is a series of talks that she and her peers developed over uh, the period of lockdown. Um, so over to um, Augustine, uh, who will be presenting first today. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, I'm Augustine Paredes. I'm a Filipino photographer living and working here in the UAE. Today I'll show you my, an amalgamation of the works that I've been doing over um, the course of four years that I've been living here in Dubai. Um, my work usually navigates um, stories that tell the stories of uh, narratives of love, loss, and longing. And this type of images, I try to incorporate poetry and my love for words, um, inspired by my experiences as a migrant worker here in the, in, in the UAE, and also my Southeast Asian consciousness and my curious gaze. Um, on my next slide, I will show you um, photographs that I've collected um, during my travels and also my, my, my life here in, in, in the country. So this first image is um, titled Boy Sleeping in Hostel Beirut. This has been um, exhibited in Latvia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and currently and recently have been sold in order for us to help um, the victims of the explosion in Beirut. This is an image that was taken in Beirut in 2017 on the way back home from, from staying in Beirut for, for, um, for over a week and experiencing the city and somehow meeting strangers and encountering um, stories of, of Lebanese people in, in, in the city of Beirut. And on the next slide is a self-portrait um, sort of interpreting, reinterpreting my um, first experience here in, in Dubai as coming from the Philippines and, you know, being greeted by a very small space um, and making it and forcing, forcing myself to call it home in, in the comforts of, of one bed alongside with all of my possessions. And this is one way of 
me trying to incorporate as well the saying kung maikli ang kumot matutong bumaluktot which means if the means are short learn how to slouch when sleeping and that is the title of the work and this work has also been exhibited in various um exhibitions in and outside um, Dubai. And the next slide is one of um, my photographs from my exhibition at Art Dubai last year. This is called, this is part of a series called Cooking Adobo in the Heart of Dubai. This is me um, questioning the violence of the question, where are you from? And also trying to interpret um, the question, where are you from? And also, uh, how to survive for how to survive for one and cook for one and um, how to to preserve the sense of home when you're a migrant worker living out living and working outside your home country and the next slide will also present um, the poetry that I have um, included in a photograph it's called the recipe and it's about the recipe for staying longer in in Dubai and this talks about um, the certain elements and certain practices that one could experience in order for him or her or them to stay longer in a place when, where they're not from. And the next slide is my recent publication. It's uh, sponsored by, no, not sponsored by, it, it has been, uh, the excerpt has been um, published in Al Circle Online. And um, it's a self-published book with 100 editions and 50 pages um, alongside, inside it are 12 poems and 19 images. And uh, the images and the, the poetry has been collected over a year after trying to understand what it feels like to turn 25 and also try to understand the investigate the the ephemerality of human existence and the next slide is um titled the peaches of peaches this is also part of conversations at the end of the universe this is inspired by um the arabic proverb tomorrow there will be apricots and um which means in your dreams or it will never happen and this is my way of interpreting um how when peaches are not available, we can always settle for apricots and, and um, appreciate the apricots that have always been there um, because peaches will take time. And the next one is, um, this has been part of my exhibition virtually in um, Abu Dhabi Art. This is one of the ex experiments I have, I, I have dealt with. Um, throughout developing conversations at the end of the universe, wherein I took photographs um, using film and analog and tried to develop it myself and kind of embracing the mistakes that happened um, uh, while developing the, the project and also while developing the images. On the next slide is entitled For Edward. This has been one of the anchors of this project because it has been um i wrote this for my friend who suddenly passed away in 2019 without any reason um that all of a sudden he just laid on the floor and was sent to the hospital and then passed away after so the the poem um you can hear and read the poem RPE and the photographs that um, are there also part of, of, of conversations at the end of the universe. And on the next slide is sort of one of the last images that I have taken um, for this project, um, wherein also it's part of, of the series of photographs that I have taken on film and developed myself and somehow Im the 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 black circles have appeared and this is my way of embracing the abyss that we talk to when we pray or we talk to when we wonder what's happening with with ourselves and somehow the abyss is also a symbolism and a metaphor for the nothingness that might happen or that might appear once all of this is over and i think that's it Thank you so much. If you have any questions, pop it on the 
Q&A box. Before you go, uh, Augustine, I just wanted to ask you um, one question, which is this form of working with both image and text is something um, that, that has sort of happened organically for you, where you have um, produced poetry that sort of um, in a way works contrapuntally to the, to the image. Um, could you say a little bit about that process and whether you think that that is something that you, uh, that kind of has come to define the way in which you work or whether um, it related to this? For, for me, I've always worked with text, um, whether or not it's personal or for research. Um, it's only very recently that I have actually embraced the poetry side of my work and somehow um, tell the poetry also through the photos. And to me, what is special about combining words and images is that photographs can only say so much and also words can only say so much. And what would happen um, if both of them are combined? Would it, would it be able to tell the things that I want to say? Would it, would it tell a better narrative? And I think that's one way of me trying to put out a deeper meaning to the conversation and to, to the dialogue that I'm trying to put out and, and anchoring it with so much words and so much um, images. And yeah, I think it's, it's, it's both a challenge to do poetry or to, to capture poetry in terms of creating a photograph. Um, and also it's a challenge to put images in, in poetry. So it's kind of this like cross pollination of, of that. We have a question asking where people can find your book. Um, is it through your website? Um, so the book has been sold out after two months of publishing it. And mm -hmm. I'm very proud of that. Thank you so much to Gulf Photo Plus, who's been home to all of my works. Um, but you can view the excerpt online at Ulster Call it online, and um, there are voice recordings um, in there wherein I read to you the, the poems that, that I've written. So for that, I'll, that's I'll, I'll, we can share the link um, with Barbara to distribute to our audience today. Yes. Thank you so much, Augustine. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I would like to introduce Sarah once again. Um, over to you, Sarah. Um, you're still on mute. There we go. Okay, I gotcha. can hear you now. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, I'm Sarah Naeem, and I'm a Syrian visual artist currently based between Dubai and London. Um, and the work that's currently shown at ADA is a video work um, that I actually made while I was doing my MFA at Slade. Um, and it's never been shown, so it's really exciting to show it. Um, I'm basically gesturing semantic primes. And semantic primes are words that can't be defined um, or made into a definition without using its own word in the definition. Um, so here I've gestured each word of the 68 semantic primes using one gesture per word. Um, and I'm fascinated with gesture because actually only 7% of human communication is based on words and the rest is based on actually gesture. So it's not just used as a way to reinforce what it is that one is saying, it's actually a language in and of itself. Um, and uh, I'm always kind of constantly looking at the way that people shape um, words with their hands and they can kind of make these more visceral, um, ephemeral things into a three-dimensional shape, which is what a lot of my practice is actually about. Um, we can see in the next uh, um, work. So the crux of my practice is based on the fact that visible light occupies um, one one thousandth of one percent within the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so we really don't see much and I'm very fascinated in sight um, as a way to describe uh, perception um, and the way that micro formations can shape the way that we actually perceive, uh, perceive basically the things around us. Um, for example, uh, in this show, When Heartstrings Collapse at Third Line, um, I had these high voltage power cables throughout the space 
uh, which was once used to transfer energy and information across Dubai, but then they're broken and corrupt. So they kind of behave as these um, faulty uh, communications or uh, communication that was kind of delivered, but not. So something broken between um, between received information and and kind of a glitch. And a lot of my work actually works with the glitch. In the background, you can see um, images of my dead skin cells under the scanning electron microscope, but then they're glitched. So it's kind of saying something, but nothing. Um, similar to the gesture work that's shown at ADA. Um, and this is uh, from my reaction series. It's, I photographed um, using expired Polaroid film light. And there is a kind of chemical reaction between the chemistry of the film and, and light. Um, and I've made these shapes based on the content within the image um, and the rim to try and kind of break the boundary between the content of the image and the rim of the artwork um, in a way to kind of free itself of its shape, although it's very shaped. But um, oh yeah, a lot of my practice is very much based on boundary and, um, and the notion of boundary actually, because on a micro level, boundary doesn't really exist. Um, and I think that's a very fundamental truth, which shapes the way we think um, and feel separate from one another. But in fact, on a cellular scale, um, it's just different densities of matter and we're completely merged and shared. Um, and the next work I think is um, from a recent series called Building Blocks, where I photographed under the scanning electron microscope also um, my dead skin cells along with Aleppo soap. Um, and uh, Yasmin and soil from my grandmother's garden in Damascus. Um, and at 50,000 times magnified, you're actually more distant from this place that was very nostalgic to me. Um, so it looks at memory and the way it's shaped between distance and examination and that kind of push and pull that exists between um, the way we remember things and the truth of it. Uh, that's my practice in the crux. <laughs> Welcome, any questions? Thank you so much, Sarah, um, and for, for sort of putting it in a, in a nutshell for us. But um, I would love to hear a little bit more about your, your process, how um, you translate these sort of uh, very, you know, the minutiae of our lives um, into these larger scale objects and what that shift in scale, like, you know, um, from what I know of your work, there's a, there's a very detailed process involved in how you decide each of these images is going to actually turn into uh, a kind of um, um, more apprehendable uh, object. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that process of transformation? Sure, yeah. Um, so I guess around 11 years ago now, I started using the scanning electron microscope. Um, I'm really interested in science, although it's not something that was my strong suit at all in, in school. Um, but I, I kind of realized that in order to describe that space I mentioned about non-boundary, you know, I was always looking at my skin as being um, a kind of illusion of the division between internal and external. And that is kind of just a, a field of um, two energy forces. And how do you kind of really describe that space? Um, not conceptually, but, but visually. And I felt that by going down to that cellular scale, using um, scientific apparatus, you're able to actually describe space where micro rises in macro. You kind of enter these, I don't have an image of it here, but these kind of terrestrial looking landscapes. Um, but in fact, it's of our skin. It's something that we embody and possess uh, all day, every day. Um, and so the process is, yeah, very um, uh, examination orientated. Um, I think that I have a lot of pleasure in the process of going really micro because it shapes the way you see macro, you know, kind of um, we've evolved to understand notions such as division and boundary in this scale. But when you go down to that scale, you're able to kind of um, explore a very different terrain. Um, so that's kind of some of my process. Um, but yeah, so these kind of more sculptural ways of working was because I felt very limited in photography, um, working really two dimensional and working only kind of, or printing and materializing, 
things when I had a show. And I wanted a daily studio practice um, where the concepts about form and shape, I could actually explore with form and shape. Um, so I started to build these, uh, these sculptures, I would say, I guess, two dimensional sculptures using um, plexi and wood and print. So it's still very photographic at its core, um, but shifting scales from 2D to 3D. Thank you. And Sarah's uh, work, I, you, someone, person, is going to be on Al Circal Online tomorrow. So please look out for that. And it's a work that, that looks at how we are bounded by language. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. We have a question, which I think we have time for, um, from Hannah Kutsi, which is, the question is, how subjective is your work? How subjective? Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, I mean, um, I think all work is subjective, um, but I also think that some of what I'm trying to explore is objective truths. I think boundary is an objective truth. Um, I think notions of lack of boundary um, are, I'm really passionate about trying to illustrate the lack of boundary between things, because I really think that in a shared space, we're able to come together much more. Um, and I do think that that is an objective reality, actually. Um, you can explore that on a quantum scale. Um, you can explore that with particles and waves, and you can explore that on, um, you know, on an emotional level. You can explore it on a conceptual level. So um, I would like to think that it's objective. Um, but of course, the way that one looks at a work without the context or text to support it, um, you'll come with your own subjective um, realizations about the work. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, and you guys can keep putting questions into the Q&A box. We'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Hi, Michael. Um, over Hi, to good morning. Good morning. Thanks, thanks for inviting me this morning. Thanks for joining us, and that's very early for you. It is very early, yeah, I'm coming to you from Berlin, so it's quite early this morning. But it's, uh, it's lovely to join you. So my name is Michael John Whelan. I'm an Irish artist born in Dublin, and I studied in London, where I did my master's uh, in Chelsea. And basically, as Nat has been saying, I've been working a lot in the UAE over the last year. So what I'm gonna show you today is a little kind of a snapshot of my practice, beginning with my most recent exhibition, which I did in Grey Noise at Al Cal, and then moving kind of back in time to the work that we're showing at 88. This is uh, the first project we showed. This is an installed shot from Grey Noise, and it's a, a project called And They Did Live by Watchfires. So what I was doing is um, making these two sister projects, this one and the next slide you'll see in a second. They're looking at uh, environmental effects and looking at how to sort of process those and how to uh, document things abstractly, but looking at kind of uh, different narratives that are involved in that. So the, the first project, And They Live by Watchfires, is looking at sky glow, which is a, an environmental phenomenon where lights from cities are refracted off environmental uh, or meteorological effects. So for example, cloud, in this, in this case here, this is a, a shot from Berlin, taken from Teufelsberg, which is a, a mountain range just outside the city. And I'm looking back in at the environmental effects that are taking place, so uh, light pollution, and looking at how that light pollution can be documented and seen as, uh, I guess, as a, a narrative of abstraction that we can then use to, to sort of think about our world and think about the effects that are taking place in our world. And this is a theme that kind of pops up a lot in my work, as we'll see moving forward. This project here is called Darkness Had No Need. I started this in 2017 and it's an ongoing project and it's looking at the darkest sites in the world. So these are basically locations that are certified for uh, astronomy and for looking at the night sky. And, and I was interested in that certification and what it means when we have to certify a, a space when, when overpopulation and light pollution are affecting the environments in such a way that we have to start defining places that are not affected by mankind. So I went to these different sites and I photographed them and I uh, saw them as an environment themselves. So looking at the landscape and documenting that. So what I did was I went with a large format camera. I don't know if people know it's a five by four camera. So really absorbing the most amount of information as possible onto the negative. 
and doing very, very long exposures. So one and a half hours up to three hour exposures, depending on each site. So in this shot that's presented today, you can see on the left side is Germany, a place called uh, West Haviland. So it's a swamp area. And you'll see different traces. So you're looking at there's a tree actually that's recorded in silhouette. So when I'm there in that space, it's completely dark. So I see nothing and only the, the technic, the, the chemistry uh, and, and the physics of the medium can actually record some traces of information. And um, yeah, and then this work here is called Nocturne. This is a kind of a, I worked a lot in, in photography. So I trained originally as a photographer. My first uh, qualification was a diploma. Very, very analog. I learned all the basics of chemistry and all these uh, different uh, facets of that medium. And I kind of have been coming back to that a lot, looking at, you know, as sustainability and how you can kind of reflect that in the medium. So here, this is a, a, a Polaroids, but a five by four type of Polaroid, not the kind of traditional one that everybody knows with a sort of bar on the bottom. And I photographed a bad enclosure, like an artificial construction in Vienna in a zoo, where there uh, basically people can walk through and, and experience being in the same space as bats. So I was looking at the different non-human uh, uh, organisms that are affected by us. In this case, you can see the shots on the bottom. There's just three samples here. Uh, they are traces of mankind are there. So there's like a CCTV camera in one of the shots. There's the gestures of a hand where someone has, has constructed a fake rock in, in the other of the shots. So this is a series of seven of them that I presented also at Grey Noise. And I'll, this is a continuing one. So the next series then we'll look at another animal that's affected by, um, by our, by our uh, environmental effects. This is a series Aqualung. So this is kind of a very large project that is uh, also inclusive of a new film, which I'm just wrapping up uh, now. And then it's, uh, yeah, photography work as well. And this is the main sculpture work. So this was co-commissioned um, by Jamil Art Center. It was presented in 2018 in an exhibition called Crude, uh, curated by Murda Zavali. And this project was looking at <clears throat> a very specific sort of chapter in history where Jacques Cousteau was working in 1954 for co-commissioned by companies that would then go on to become British Petroleum and Total to do surveys in the Persian Gulf. <clears throat> so he went around and he did different site surveys and geological surveys into the seabed itself with his dive team. And using that information that was passed down and eventually became uh, you know, a source of information for the, the oil drilling that took place off the coast of Abu Dhabi. So I went with a dive team. We were filming, we were photographing, and we were also non-invasively collecting sand samples from these sites. And then I went and I worked with a, a Murano trained glassmaker who's based in Denmark. And together we made in a very traditional, uh, basic way, batches of glass. So glass from, from scratch. And we blew it into used diving cylinders. So cylinders that have had their whole life used over time to sustain life underwater. So we cut the top off and we blew the glass into those cylinders. And it, you can see in this shot here, it takes the traces and the effects from inside the cylinders on the outside of the glass. And the glass itself has these different traces, these air bubbles, these particles, and these impurities actually that come from the sand. And yeah, so this is a series of 15 that was presented. The next project is inclusions. A lot of my works are quite ongoing to sort of give that spectrum over time. So you can see the different, uh, different points over time in them. And this is a series that's also ongoing. And what I've done is, this is a particular one that's relevant to the UAE as well. So we are basically collecting rubbish or trash that you see uh, out in the sea. It's kind of a basic thing. I'm a diver and when we're out anyway, it's a, a basic thing that you do when you're on a boat, you just see something plastic or whatever and you're always collecting it. So I started to think of these um, moments and how uh, we can kind of put that into a point of discussion or a kind of a like, monument to, to, to ourselves. So this is a, a, an LED party balloon that you see quite often in Dubai with the kind of flashing lights that the kids have around walking around the streets. This is 120 kilometers out in the sea. We found this floating in a corroding and potentially damaging fish life. This was the first in that series and it's cast into a concrete cube and um, quite small, 15 by 15 by 15. And this just sits quietly in a space or in an exhibition as this, as I say, this is a Zoic monument um, to our effects. And this continued then with different, uh, all over the world now. So I've been, and also different scales. The scale is dependent on the object itself that's, that's taken from the sea. So in my next slide, this is uh, also part of that 
larger body of work that I was mentioning to do with initially to do with Jacques Cousteau. And at one of these sites, uh, we collected water from that exact moment and we photographed two shots. And this is the air bubbles coming from the diver's respirator. So this, this uh, um, outflux of the sustainability of life underwater, this thing that keeps us uh, alive underwater, but is also a wider discussion of what is needed in, in, in our planet, looking at coral and looking at uh, nature, as, uh, and coral particularly in the Gulf as being the lungs of the sea. And a photograph was taken of these two, two breaths of the diver coming out seconds apart, and then five seconds after that, the water was taken. The water then is used to treat the wooden frames, creating a, yeah, you can, it's only one shot here, so you can't really see it, but there's more information on the website and on gray noise. You can see stains in the wood, which is actually the salt stains of the sea itself. So giving a kind of a physicality to that, to that point, or trying to give a physicality to that floating point within the water, that, that moment, and um, that has this trauma and this history behind it. Uh, yeah. So the next slide you'll see uh, also a project I did. This was actually also exhibited in Grain Noise in 2014 in the solo there. And this was a project, a lot of my work is very research-based, so I'll go in and, and look at a, a traumatic story or a, or a historical moment and sort of investigate that and look at how that can be represented and how that can be investigated through film and video sculptural works. This project was in that process. I was looking at a place in Ireland at the base of Mount Leinster, which is a small mountain near where I grew up, where the last Irish wolf was killed in 1786. That came with it, of course, a very large political story of Irish and, and our relationship to the British at the time, and how the wolves were also seen as the Irish rebels. So there was a whole kind of narrative behind that. And I went to these sites and I photographed and I made a small film there, a nine and a half minute film from the mountain. And I made a sculpture work and I made these photographic works. And this is looking at that site this kind of charged location and looking at it around. So you can see connections back to the darkness project, looking at the site itself. And this is looking up from that exact point through my research where I could find where the last Irish wolf was killed. And it's looking up at the stars and it's using uh, the technology. It's drawing through the technology to try and find information. Again, I couldn't really see anything. So using a digital image this time, I was able to draw out information. And what you ended up with is seeing a section of the Milky Way. But the caveat is that you have these lines of the digital um, membrane as it were. So you're looking through kind of a veil of technology to see. So there's always some kind of caveat to the conversation. The next is a video work. I thought it would be interesting to show videos or, you know, that's what we showed at ADA as well. So I work um, in, in different ways with video and with film. Sometimes I work with a video installation, which can be quite minimal and not a lot of effects happening and creating a sense of, of um, deceleration for the viewer where they have to spend a little of time and sort of commit a bit of time to that uh, video work. In this case, um, this is a, what's called a shy wave generator. So this is a very simple uh, tool to show, to give kind of a, as it were, a visibility to invisible forces. So you're, you're seeing actually uh, poles in the, on, on two kind of strings and somebody can go and they wave them and you actually see how a wave works. And this was filmed uh, at a basement in Bangalore in a planetarium where I did a residency in 2015. And the idea is that you kind of, you, you, you first of all are in the space with this object and with this idea of science and how we need to sort of uh, present ourselves these um, mechanics to see the invisible forces, to see that what's behind everything that happens in our life. Um, and then it's looped, so you're kind of caught in this uh, quiet moment where you see it again and again and again. So this is, it's a seamless loop, so you don't actually, you don't know when it starts and when it ends actually. And the next work is, it's quite uh, exciting to, to be uh, asked to present it because it's from 2007. And it was, when it initially finished, it was shown a lot. And then kind of, as, as always happens with an artist, it kind of goes into the background. And it was a, a work I did uh, just when I'd moved to Berlin, actually. And there's an old cinema, one of the oldest cinemas in Berlin called the Tilsiter Lichtspiele. Um, and I made a short film there about a, a man who follows these very strange events um, on his own space. There's nobody else in the cinema. He's in a bar in the front of the cinema. And he's kind of going through these uh, obsessive and slightly strange uh, um, techniques. And he's looking at a Polaroid and he's doing also the normal stuff like lighting the candles and preparing candles for the bar. And then he goes in uh, to the back and he presents a Super 8 film, which is his kind of personal obsessive collection or documentation of 
clouds. So he's sort of obsessed with his um, somehow capturing uh, the uncapturable, the, the fleeting, and he presents that and he watches that. And then he has a small moment. I won't say too much because it's obviously live today, so everyone can go and watch it. But he goes and he, he interacts with his own representations of nature. So that was, uh, yeah, that's, that's all the little snapshot from today. But everything is, there's more stuff online and on the website if anyone's interested. Thank you so much. Um, Pleasure. <laughs> Um, I was was thinking while while you were telling us uh, about uh, you know kind of going back in time really for us um, about how uh, certain works that you've made have have to me personally seemed strangely prescient um, and you know I had that feeling when um, when looking at a rough cut of the video that you're working on now. Um, where you know, you know, where breathing is is a sort of central motif in in that work, uh, and while you were showing actually the the images of the the bat caves at the moment, um, I was thinking about this sort of um, you know the and and the relationship between between man and nature um, through that work and and so much of what we have been so preoccupied with uh, this past year is precisely that relationship. Um, and of course, you know, um, this is not deliberate, this is coincidence, but I wondered if you, if you speculate on that coincidence and, and whether uh, you feel that, um, you know, that kind of articulation of somehow having your finger on the pulse is something that is germane to your practice or if it's something that you don't really worry too much about. Um, I mean, as I said, I research a lot, so I'm always having five or six projects that are always in my, in my studio and in my mind that I'm, I'm developing. And sometimes they're cross pollinating between each other. But of course, as like, if you spend, for example, on the film that's over two years working on that, you're, you're looking at investigating different elements and you go back and you film again, they start to become influenced by what's happening in the world and your own personal direction after let's say a year, it can be quite different than where you started off. You may still have, for example, in the film, the same footage that you have already shot, but where it's going, becomes influenced by what's happening. I mean, with mm -hmm. regards to what's happened with, with Corona, um, it is the breathing aspect was always about sustainability. And that's coming from our uh, dependence on the natural world. So for sure, it's, it's a parallel to Corona, what's happening. So I was looking at coral and how that is affected and how we're dependent on that. But yeah, so it's, it's very kind of, um, yeah, it's very influenced, of course, by what's happening. So I think, yeah, you, the work becomes changed over time. And then in this case, some of the more recent projects, they are being influenced by Corona and by isolation and by our own dependency on our physical bodies. So that's where sort of new works are. I, I sort of see that looking at them. And maybe I won't really know until they're finished, but I see the effects of, of this last month on the new projects. So yeah, it is, for me, it's always changing until the point where it's, it has to sort of be finished, where it goes into for the film and it goes into the edit or, or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it was really uncanny for me uh, to to come across the collector of skies because it's so perfectly described for me what we are going through now, even though it's a work from 2007. Um, so thank you again for letting us include that. Yes, um, thank you. It was a pleasure. Um, I'm going to move on now to Sarah al -Nahiri. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for waiting patiently. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing more about your practice. Uh, first of all, thank you, Neda and the lovely art team and the patron circle that are here today. Um, very honored to be a part of this among amazing artists. And uh, so, yeah, I'm an artist, a Malawi artist based in Abuja, and I explore themes of materiality form, language, and memory between the realm of narrative and abstract and image and poetry. And I'll be taking you through a lot of my graduation show that was then shown at Carbon 12 uh, last fall. So this work here is a painting called Blueberry in which I investigate memories um, that I may or may not have had um, from Tennessee in which where my grandmother is from. And the title suggests what the object is as I paint it on such a um, micro level. Um, and um, it's a window into um, 
a heritage learning and unlearning that as well. And uh, on the next slide, you can see an installation shot from the show itself um, with the other paintings that were there. I have also painted a firefly, um, a tractor tire, um, denim, and a water tower in which I investigate these objects that are very faint in my memory, uh, yet are so vivid in color. And that's where the uh, droppings of the color uh, of the line from the painting uh, come down. And then in the next slide is another series of works called Building Blocks, in which I collect wood scraps and I put them together and play with them until they seem resolved. And uh, this is an ongoing series actually. This one particularly is from the second series of this uh, body of work in which I also um, look at the uh, natural pigments from the wood and try to recreate that with acrylic paint. And a lot of my work as well is very, uh, has a very particular palette. Um, it's quite muted as well. So I like to have this neon line that goes through the work as well to break that sort of palette that you can see in front of you. And um, yeah, this is an, also an installation shot amongst the first series and second series of the work. And um, with my practice also investigating this form of language, I install them in such a way where I see it almost as a sentence or a map or a puzzle piece that you're trying to put together. Where does one line start? Where does the other end? And uh, the viewer can make those connections as well. And on the next side is a piece called Fictionalized Structures in which instead of using my memories or my grandmother's memories, I look at an archived image um, of coal miners in Tennessee. And I believe there, um, there are six pieces in this series. And I had cut up the photo itself and started to work formally um, and started to create these shapes uh, from, the sh uh, from the image itself. So I wasn't looking at the memory perhaps, but coming at it in such a way where I was interested in form and interested in shapes and how can a memory or a photograph go beyond itself as well. And then in the next slide um, is the work for Abu Dhabi Art this year. This was actually part um, of the body of work, but I had not shown it. Um, and it's called In Conversation. It's graphite and acrylic on wood. And I'd used language from Actus Martin, which I was very inspired by for the show. And um, I did a lot of, uh, I was reading a lot of her diary entries and she talks a lot about the subconscious and making and how you also make subconsciously. I was really interested in that idea. And so I intuitively started to pick out words and sentences from, uh, from her diaries and hand wrote them until I felt it was resolved or enough was said. And then in response to that, I, I was looking at my own poetry from, um, I, I also often work, uh, I create work and also write simultaneously. So I was looking back at those notes in my studio and uh, also intuitively um, uh, picking out those sentences and writing in response to that. And then there is a sentence in between that says this must be resolved. And I think that's really um, funny because I don't think that the work uh, or the, the conversation is at a resolved state. It's, it's constantly in conversation, as the title suggests. And then in the next slide, going back to the, the building box and wood series, it's a body of work that I'm constantly um, I'm constantly creating and expanding. And so this one in particular was shown uh, earlier this year online on the Untitled Art Fair um, alongside uh, Austrian painter Bernard Uhmann. And we were speaking about color and form. And uh, for this series in particular, I was also incorporating found furniture pieces as I often find just wooden scraps um, that are recycled. I wanted to include unique pieces that I find on my walks um, and on my treasure hunts. And 
the next yes um this is my most recent body of work it was um created in as part of the Sheikha Salam event have done emerging artist fellowship in collaboration with the Rhode Island School of Design and it's currently shown at warehouse 421 so if you're in the city make sure to check it out in uh, in person and um, it's a it's an installation of 40 plaster casts of a styrofoam box and uh, the mold started to break on me when actually creating it and so I took that further and started to incorporate change and repeti repetition and exhaustion in the work. Every single time I would cast the piece, I would remove something from it or add something back into it that was native from the box itself. And um, I then set rules for myself for the installation to, to find lines. I think you can also make that connection between the building blocks in this work as well, where I'm very interested in lines and layers as uh, um, to organize collected information. And so I started to put them together and they're containers, yet they contain themselves as well. And on the next slide, you can see that there is, I've added blue tape to mark the negative spaces on a two dimensional level on the floor as well, as the cast themselves are uh, positive impressions of negative space. And so just further investigating what negative space means, how can you, what is a container, and um, is there an end or a beginning to a work? And the main question is, uh, what is an original? And is everything an original as it's always stemming from somewhere else? Repositioning, replacing, and reformatting. And then in the last slide is, um, also shown as part of Abu Dhabi Art, in which I began this community initiative project uh, called Artist Talks, in which I reach out to artists that are based in or affiliated with the UAE and uh, have a conversation uh, very in a, in a very informal setting, but amongst people in the community uh, where people can ask questions and um, engage in a conversation in, in, a, in a learning and supportive environment. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and congratulations on the show at Seif. I really cannot wait to see it. Um, and before we uh, open up to the floor, I just wanted to ask you a question about Artist Talks. Um, if you could just tell us about where the idea came from and how this sort of evolved um, and maybe tell us a little bit about the series. Um, so it was in response to the COVID situation that happened when we had lockdown around February or March, I believe, and the series started in April. And it was a conversation amongst friends that um, that felt that the community we needed to know more about the people that are in the community, their practices, where is a platform beyond institution that can uh, then house these talks or just house these conversations. So I took the initiative to um, start one and one became two, three. <laughs> and um, there are people that I know and people that I may not know that well. So it was also a great way for me to have these conversations and, and have a more uh, tight knit community. And um, it was just really in response to having a space to speak about work. Sometimes uh, artists themselves even wanted critique sessions and uh, that, that's also something the platform um, uh, allows. <laughs> and uh, you can also find these on YouTube. So they act as an archive um, as well for, for those that want to come back because they are live but uh where you can ask live questions but you can also access them at a different time and um i would encourage everybody who's listening today to to um to access this kind of amazing archive of contemporary practice um in i think it's gone beyond just the uae um really of the region um I think we can open up to questions for all of the artists at this stage. Um, I can see one here, which is addressed to Augustine, uh, which is from Mervi. Um, 
Augustine, after the devastating effects of Typhoon Ulysses, volcanic eruptions, the COVID pandemic, etc., do you think, uh, which, which, which of your works do you think best um, describes or showcases the, re the resilience of the Filipino community? Um, hi, thank you so much, Mary, Mary V, for that question. Um, the resilience of Filipino people has always been um, there. Uh, it's always been part of my work, but also if I were to point out in a specific photo, it's the how to slouch when sleeping um, photo. And my work in Art Dubai, which was uh, cooking adobo in the heart and heat of Dubai, is one of um, that kind of work, that work, specifically points out to the resilience of a Filipino body living and working in a migrant place. And I do also have a problem with the resiliency of Filipino people because there is so many wrong things that our government is doing to us. And we don't have a choice just to be, except for us to be resilient and kind of deal with all the struggles that we're going through um, in our own ways. And if I were to speak about resiliency in my work, it will always be at the heart of my practice. Um, whether or not it's dealing with the materials that I use for my photography, it's going to be the way I write my words and how limited I am um, in, with, with materials and with words and with photographs and trying to make it work. Um, that's that sort of... Um, I hope that answers the question. I, I do hope that, that that speaks in behalf of my resiliency and yeah. Thanks, Augustine. Um, do we have any more questions or comments from the audience? Or do you guys have any questions or comments for each other? I have one which I think any of you could, could answer. Um, and, and it was really interesting, actually, to, to hear you present one after the other. Um, a, I was, I was stuck, struck really by um, the interest in photographic process um, and, and taking uh, the photograph, which we, which we know of as a very kind of representational technology and pushing it into abstraction. Um, and then also just abstraction. And I realized that, that all four of you um, are at, at some ways formally really interested in the language of abstraction. Um, and I wondered if, if you could, you know, uh, perhaps address that, um, that kind of urge um, in terms of, um, you know, pushing away from the represent, representational um, to a more open-ended form. I mean, I think you can say a lot more with abstraction. I think uh, it doesn't have to be so dictated uh, with what you say. And that question about subjectivity and objectivity is very interesting that someone asked. But um, I think abstraction can change the way you think, can change or shape the way you perceive, because um, you're kind of looking at something in a less defined way. And you yourself, as a viewer, will be able to enter into that space of questioning your relationship between something um, rather than if it wasn't, you know, abstract. I think it's much more um, dictated. Sarah, I see you've unmuted yourself. Were you going to add something? <laughs> um, sure, I can add something. I think abstraction is really interested, uh, interesting as well in terms of a uh, narrative. Um, Sarah also said, uh, that it's not clear. Um, I also see abstraction as a language and I use that quite often in my work. I believe that you shouldn't give everything to the viewer and there should be that space in between where um, this investigation between the, the viewer and the artist is kind of lingering. And I, I think that's really beautiful. That's what abstraction means to me. Anna Kutsi has asked, is abstraction veiling our memories? And I'm going to ask MJ to answer that as the last question, because I can see Barbara 
um, waiting to make her final comments. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just initially just wanted to say that for me, how abstraction works is also allowing for accessibility. So particularly with me, when I'm talking about a topic that's quite difficult, um, you, you know, you can really just represent that or you can actually create a space where there is accessibility for that. Where someone can kind of enter into the, the world that you've presented and then behind that is this other narrative, this other sort of discussion. Uh, in my case, it was like with the light pollution that, that can come then from behind. Uh, Veiling our memories, I, 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 yeah, maybe. I think in, it can also be opening memories. It can do the opposite, actually. So it can kind of create a space where people have to sort of go in with their, with, with what they bring to the work. And then it ends up sort of triggering other memories or triggering associations that they have to, to the things that are presented or the ideas that are presented. It's a great answer. Thank you. Well, thank I, you so much. Oh, Augustine, go ahead. No, I wanted to add on to MJ's uh, thing. Um, abstract For me, abstraction is, um, it creates a space for intimacy for the viewers and the readers as well, because um, that kind of time wherein they decipher what's happening with the visual that they see kind of creates this short-term relationship and forms a short-term history um, to the viewer and to the artist as well. So that's all I wanted to add. Well, I hope all of you will form that relationship with these artists' works by, by visiting the exhibition of Picture Held Us Captive um, over the course of the next few days. And thank you so much, Barbara, for this opportunity. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Augustine, Sarah, Michael John, Sarah, and Nada for this fantastic insight into your art and for sharing with us your knowledge and your passion. As I said earlier, the virtual Abu Dhabi art started the 19th of November and will continue till the 26th. For this first time ever, six guest curators will work with galleries and artists to present work online, each with a different geographic focus. Abu Dhabi art has prepared a great program for you, so please don't hesitate to go on their website, abudhabiart.ae, where you will find all the information about the fair and its program. Do not also hesitate to follow our website and Instagram, theartcircle.ae, where you will find a replays of our webinar, but also all information about the Art Circle. On behalf of the Art Circle board, I would like to thank you all for coming today and for joining us. Stay safe, stay tuned, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.